Hello and thanks for listening. This is the third lesson in our course on superconduction and its applications to space exploration and colonization. Please don't forget to like and subscribe and Patreon is live at patreon.com slash Terran Space Academy. If you can help support our efforts to educate you on the latest technologies in the space industry, we would really appreciate it. Today we will focus on high temperature superconductors and their applications to propulsion. The underlying science is critical to a full understanding of this important technology. We have focused on niobium titanium wire for our superconductors because they are strong, durable, and in use today for commercial applications. The last is very important. You want to be innovative as you design your space systems, but you don't want to be waiting for a technological breakthrough to make it viable. If we wait on effective economical fusion drives for space exploration, we'd better be in our late teens or early 20s. It is best to make systems that work with proven available technology, while keeping an eye on scientific development. Closely watching those fields for a breakthrough would be immediately useful to the space industry. There are many areas that we must watch closely, but some technologies affect thousands of others. One of those is superconduction. Superconductors are materials through which there is no resistance to the flow of electrons. Magnets made from superconductors are over five times stronger than non-superconducting magnets for the same amount of electrical power. The magnets in an MRI or on a levitating train are made from either niobium titanium or niobium tin, both of which we discussed earlier are surrounded by copper. These are formed into solenoids. Solenoids are just coils of conductive wire used to maximize the magnetic field produced by a current running through a wire. Here you see a solenoid coil. And here you can see one used in a stepper motor. A push type solenoid uses a spring to hold something closed. It is always pushing. But when electricity is applied to the coil, the electromotive force pulls the plunger back in and releases whatever it was holding against. A pull type solenoid is open or permanently pulling until activated by electricity at which point the plunger is pushed out. We will go over valves used in the space industry soon. The stepper motor is a very easy way to see how magnetic fields can be used in simple devices to make useful actuators. Remember that superconducting wires create magnetic fields over five times stronger than normally conducting materials for the same amount of power and they don't heat up as the current is passed through. An MRI machine using either niobium tin or niobium titanium wire will be cooled by liquid helium. Liquid helium is one of the coldest substances known to humans. Liquid helium boils at 4.2 Kelvin. Remember that if you are boiling a liquid, it will maintain its temperature, expelling heat energy and evaporation until all the liquid is a gas. That is why all boiling water at sea level is at 100 Celsius. The liquid helium keeping our magnets at 4.2 Kelvin is perfect, since most superconducting niobium alloys have a critical temperature of 10 Kelvin. Below 10 Kelvin, they are superconducting. Above 10 Kelvin, they are not. Helium is in limited supply on the Earth, and compressing it to liquid form takes a lot of energy. It is very expensive to cool these MRI magnets, so we can see into patients. If we could use liquid hydrogen, which will stay in a fully liquid state below 20 Kelvin, we could do a lot more with superconductors. Niobium germanium has a critical temperature of 23 Kelvin, we could use liquid hydrogen to cool it, but it's still very energy intensive to liquefy hydrogen. On the moon, we could use liquid hydrogen from our rocket fueling tanks to keep niobium germanium superconducting energy storage capacitors below their critical temperature. But for most applications, we need superconductors that work at higher temperatures. This is where high temperature superconductors come in. High temperature here means anything above the ridiculously cold temperature of 73.15 Kelvin. This is the lowest temperature reachable using liquid nitrogen. Nitrogen is abundant and relatively cheap to liquefy. If we could use liquid nitrogen, we could use superconductors in a lot of applications much more cheaply. The first high-speed superconductor discovered in 1986 was yttrium barium copper oxide. This material has nanoscale planes of copper oxide that are critical to superconducting. This material is also a ceramic meaning it is a crystalline oxide, nitride, or carbide compound. These materials are hard and strong but brittle. 
They can withstand most chemical erosion by acids or caustics. Any defects, such as crystal grains, grain boundaries, vacancies, or pores in the material, have a negative effect on its ability to superconduct. A perfect superconductor could theoretically pass an unlimited amount of electricity, but these imperfections in our materials cannot be completely avoided, so all superconductors will have a critical current. Exceeding the critical current will cause a loss of superconduction and the sudden generation of resistance and heat and the weakening of the magnetic field. So let's note, the critical temperature is the temperature at or below which a material becomes superconducting. The critical current is the amount of current which, if reached or exceeded, will cause loss of superconduction. Nanoengineering will continue to reduce these imperfections, but it is hard to imagine that any material will ever be perfect. But if we stay within the temperature and current limits, we can have higher temperature superconductors. Many space technologies will benefit from the use of high temperature superconductors. If we can find one that's more malleable than ceramic, it will be a lot easier to shape into the coils and other structures that we need. If liquid nitrogen works, liquid hydrogen will work fine as it is colder and available almost everywhere humans want to go. So let's look at some of these applications. We often see moon buggies from the Apollo era bouncing around the lunar surface. The fact that NASA was able to design, build, and deploy these in just a few years is incredible. These machines folded up and were stored under the lunar lander. Since they would stay on the moon, they did not limit the return sample mass. A lot was learned from the Apollo missions, including the fact that the lunar dust was so abrasive that a few more weeks of use and the lunar rovers would have failed. Even the Apollo spacesuits would have failed at their joints. Lunar dust is not weathered by wind, water, or other erosive processes like the dust here on Earth. The lunar dust is barbed and more abrasive than sandpaper. The bearings in the rover's wheels would rapidly break down, causing it to grind to a halt. Magnetic bearings are extremely useful already here on Earth. They are used on some of the massive wind turbines that we see collecting green energy for our power grids. The opposing magnetic fields levitate the axle without physical contact. Brushless electric motors can turn an axle without contact. That means the exposed metal surfaces are not in contact for the abrasive lunar dust to invade. This will be very helpful on both the Moon and Mars. Superconducting bearings take a lot less power than regular electromagnets and project more force. Another very useful propulsion system that will benefit from superconduction is what we call a mass driver or rail launcher. Most of these are depicted as short tracks producing high g-forces to be used for cargo only. There is no reason, however, why a levitating train cannot acquire much higher speeds over a longer distance and be used to accelerate a small spacecraft saving a lot of propellant. Superconducting magnets can levitate and accelerate a rail car with a launch vehicle on top. If we accelerate at 12 meters per second squared, just a little over 1 g, and tolerable by almost anyone, we can exceed the lunar escape velocity of 2.4 kilometers per second. In fact, we would have a velocity of 2.7 kilometers per second. We can achieve that velocity in only 238 seconds. This would require a track of about 600 kilometers to get up to speed. You can slow a train with no passengers much faster than you can accelerate one with passengers. So let's say 100 kilometers to slow down. The spacecraft can be released at peak velocity. That means a track of 700 kilometers total and the spacecraft has more than lunar escape velocity before it uses any propellant at all. Superconducting magnets would make this a very efficient way to launch spacecraft from the moon. When ships return from outer space to land on the moon, they can come down over the same track at full speed. The train can accelerate and match their speed, dock with the spaceship, then slow down using a superconducting magnetic braking system. The ship wouldn't have to use propellant to come to a full stop and land. If anything went wrong, they could lift back up. This would be hair raising at first, but supersonic fighter jets land on aircraft carriers all the time using a cable braking system to help absorb their momentum. If everything isn't just right, they can lift back off. With computer assisted docking and maneuvering, this could become a very safe and efficient way to get on and off the moon or any other airless body in the solar system. Phobos, Deimos, Ceres, Vesta, Mercury, and Pluto just to name the big ones. But just reaching lunar escape velocity is not enough. What if we have a trained crew on a rescue mission? 
They can withstand at least 3 Gs of acceleration. Let's make our track 1100 kilometers with 1000 kilometers to speed up and 100 kilometers to slow down the empty train. At an acceleration of 30 kilometers per second, we would have a velocity of more than 5.7 kilometers per second. We would escape lunar gravity with lots of velocity to make a fast trip. What are the limits to this technology? The length of the track is important as finding an unobstructed path is critical. You would also have to make sure that your track ran around the equator of the moon so you wouldn't launch yourself out of the ecliptic. Then the moon's rotation would have to be timed so you were pointed in the right direction. You can't be making any turns or going over any hills while launching. At these velocities, the resulting forces would tear the track from the ground. Assuming we have designed our level track, what about propelling a cargo ship down this track at 10 Gs? How fast would it be going? Let's assume 1,000 kilometers to accelerate and launch the ship, then 100 kilometers to come to a stop. We would have a velocity of about 10.5 kilometers per second at launch. The cargo ship would shoot off into space with all its power and propellant ready to continue its mission. A large enough rail system could provide an amazing way to send probes into the solar system and beyond. What if we accelerate a probe at 100 Gs? There are electronics that are used in artillery shells, even cameras that survive more than this. At 100 G, our probe shoots off into space at more than 33 kilometers per second. We would get to the moons of Jupiter in about 205 days, with no propellant used until decelerating on arrival if that was necessary for the probe. Something to think about. Let's assume we have launched a crew of 12 on a mission to Mercury. We accelerated at a tolerable 3 Gs, so we have a velocity of 5.75 kilometers per second as we leave the moon. Once the spacecraft is headed out to space, what could superconduction do to power the propulsion system of the ship? Remember the liquid helium-cooled superconducting magnets used for fusion energy applications? If we used deuterium to cool our magnets before injecting the propellant into the fusion chamber, and we were using a higher temperature superconductor, then we could use some helium-3 fuel and compress it all with powerful electromagnetic pulses like you see demonstrated in this space propulsion system here. We would create a magnetic vise that compresses the ionized fuel to fusion. We would then use superconducting magnets to prevent the superheated propellant from touching the sides of our engine and guide it out the back. A fusion vasimer, if you will. If you're not familiar with vasimer technology, please review our course on advanced electrothermal rocket engines. Our ship could reach tremendous velocities very efficiently without generating neutron radiation. Our superconducting magnets would be five times more powerful with the same power input as regular magnets. These are all excellent applications of superconduction, but these would not work on Earth. The atmosphere of Earth is thick at altitudes comfortable for humans. That means our high-speed conducting trains would generate a lot of air resistance, requiring more energy and causing stress and heating of our structures. Could this be put to a good use? It turns out that we have a problem with flight in atmosphere. Why can't we just fly a jet to the edge of the atmosphere, then rocket into space? The most efficient system for subsonic atmospheric flight is a propeller or turbofan engine. But the large blade at the front creates a lot of resistance near the speed of sound. For supersonic flight, you need to remove that blade and stick with smaller compressor blades. This allows you to fly much faster, but you burn a lot of fuel getting up to speed. And hypersonic flight is very different from subsonic or even supersonic flight. An expanding nozzle allows subsonic compressed air to expand and speed up, but the same structure will slow hypersonic airflow. A converging area will do the opposite, slow down subsonic flow and speed up hypersonic. The tail of the X-15 had to have a blunt leading edge so it would be stable in supersonic flight. This made it terrible for subsonic flight. But what if you build a hypersonic space plane? The Skylon space plane plans to climb into orbit from a runway, but its engines are very inefficient at takeoff and slow speeds. It burns a lot of fuel getting up to good operating velocity and altitude. If you could get a plane like this up to supersonic speeds without burning any of its own fuel, you could dramatically increase the efficiency and reduce the fuel mass, thereby increasing the payload mass. Install hypersonic optimized engines on the sides like the Sabre engines already designed and tested for Skylon. Put it on a magnetic levitation train and accelerate it along the track. You could even use a rocket engine to supplement the electromagnetic motors just before launch. 
Get the ship up to supersonic velocity. Ignite the hypersonic engines and release from the train car. Burn atmospheric oxygen and fuel at high efficiency while climbing through the atmosphere. Then use liquid oxygen to burn with the fuel and propel yourself on into orbit. Just a thought. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to like and subscribe and support us on Patreon if you can. There are links in the description and credits will run at the end of this and future videos to show appreciation for the work of others. Stay safe. Thank you.